Okay, yeah, let's talk about CI CD and uh, a bit of Kotlin as well. But before we do that, let's start with a little thought exercise. And uh, if you can all please recall the time when you had to deploy some software. Maybe something that you worked on for a few hours, maybe it's a few days, maybe it's a few weeks, a few months, hopefully not more than a few months. Anyway, all the tests are passing, everything is ready, you just need to press a big red button and the thing goes uh, to users. Good, so let's press that big red button. It has a nice audible click, nice uh, tactile feel to it, uh, like a good mechanical keyboard can have. Uh, you know, one of those uh, MX Blue switches, uh, that one. Um, anyway, and once you press it, it's off to the races, it's out of your control, it's out of your hands, and all you can do is essentially uh, sit back in silence and uh, wait and enjoy the show. And then you have two options. One option is uh, you continue sitting in silence, uh, holding your breath until you go blue in the face, uh, because you're super scared that uh, it's gonna blow up spectacularly and start crashing for your users and uh, you're gonna have a terrible time trying to put it all back. Or, this works way better. Um, actually, it's not a football today. <laughs> it, it works real bad it's, if it's a football uh, match today, but anyway, or if it's a Friday. It's a Friday, 4 p.m., you've done your job, uh, close your laptop, you go home. I, I, I prefer the option B, to be honest. Um, but the difference between the two is not that dramatic that you might expect. And it really all, bo all boils down to the level of automation you have in place and how confident you are in that automation that you have in place. And uh, that's essentially the topic of this talk. That and agriculture, of course. Um, because software is very, very, very similar to, growing software is very, very much similar to growing uh, crops. So, um, and even if this talk is not about agriculture, I like to compare that uh, to it. Because you constantly need to be kind of working this field that you have and investing in it and putting work in order to get something out at the end of the process. And uh, just like this field, you can do everything manually. You can have, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 people working this, planting everything, uh, all the seeds, uh, picking everything up, plowing manually, uh, watering everything, making sure that everything is weeded and so on. Or you can employ some tools and uh, means of automation that makes your life a lot easier, like tractors, automated plows, harvesters. I don't know uh, what you use in, in farms. Um, or you can take this a few steps further, like get a super high-tech automated uh, greenhouse where you control everything, the temperature, humidity, uh, light, uh, I imagine air pressure, nutrients that get fed to each individual plant that you grow. And I imagine those robot hands, they um, use some computer vision um, to detect which plant is the ripest so it can actually be picked up and then sold for maximum profit because that's all we're about, right? And that greenhouse analogy is a perfect example of a really finely tuned CI-CD process. And uh, that's what I'm talking about today. And just like this greenhouse and just like these robots, um, they can misbehave somewhat. They're probably not gonna turn into dinosaurs, uh, robot dinosaurs trying to kill us all. One would hope, I hope, uh, but just like those robots can misbehave, they can ruin your crops, your CI CD system, your other type of automation that you have in place can misbehave, and it can ruin, you, ruin your user's day, and of course, your day as well. But fret not, it's never the machine's fault, it's always us. Uh, the great, lovely truth about software, um, yes, it's always us, and with that in mind, let me introduce myself. My name is Dan Markin. I'm a developer advocate at CircleCI and I've broken way too many builds to actually count them. Um, and yeah, it's my great pleasure to be here today with you. So yeah, let's talk about succeeding with CI-CD so that yes, your automation doesn't rise up against you and uh, ruin your day. 
so you can actually enjoy your Fridays after you've made your deploys. I work for a little company called Circle CI. We are the leading CI CD provider, and we've been around for about a decade and really help teams of all sizes in all types of organizations, from open source projects to, to large enterprises, build and test and essentially manage their complexity in their code. Um, depending, it doesn't really matter what kind of technology you use, this really applies to everything. But this talk is not about Circle CI, this talk is about CI CD in general and uh, how it can actually help you or how you can make sense of it uh, with a Kotlin spin basically. Um, but before we go any deeper, let's just untangle the acronyms CI. Uh, I would hope you all are familiar with it, but if you're not, let's just go through it. CI, continuous integration, it's a process of automatically building and testing and verifying your software as you uh, check it into the repository. It's basically as you push, it, push a commit to, let's say, a GitHub repository, um, this triggers what we call a pipeline or a build. Um, which executes in its own CI CD runtime. Uh, usually that's a Docker container uh, that you specified from an actual image or a virtual machine, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then it runs whatever you want it to run. Uh, any tests, functional, integrational, uh, unit tests, or anything that you want to, to test, verify. You can scan for vulnerabilities, you can do static code analysis, linting, and so on. And ultimately this process of CI results in a built application, built binary, built library. Um, it's really agnostic to what kind of technology you're using, whether you're programming in Kotlin, whether this is a multi-platform application, whether it's not Kotlin at all. It's essentially the same process, just with different scripts that you're running. What's also important is that we define everything in a single file uh, or in files, which are stuck in the same repo, so it's all essentially defined as code. At Circle we use YAML um, as the format, which then runs your scripts. And uh, that's essentially tied to the same commit. So it's always, if it passes in that given environment with these constraints that you've kind of specified, it will always pass for that specific commit. That's the beauty of it. You get the reproducibility, like that uh, uber-controlled uh, greenhouse that we saw earlier. Um, and of course, if it fails, it will always fail for that commit. Um, so yeah, continuous deployment is then taking this a few steps further and actually getting your build application or build project to where it needs to go. Whether that's testers, whether that's production users, um, and whatever that environment is, whether it's Play Store, App Store, uh, or uh, your Kubernetes cluster, it doesn't really matter. You basically write some scripts that are specific to that and uh, this then gets executed uh, automatically as part of your development flow. And that's a complex process, the whole thing, CI, CD. Uh, there's a lot of bits in there, like you're, you're dealing with uh, language specific things, uh, like you're dealing with compilers, you're dealing with a build system like Gradle, Maven, uh, whatever you're doing. Um, you're, you're dealing with uh, uh, the things that are specific to the platform that you're deploying, so Kubernetes, uh, um, Play Store, it, it really, really depends on so many different factors and uh, we'll try to untangle some of those that are the most important in these kind of dimensions, as I call them. So without further ado, yeah, by the way, th there is uh, a couple of things that are cool with Kotlin. Um, one is, yeah, you've got multi-platform support. So you write one language and you can uh, deploy it to or execute it on multiple uh, platforms or you, you write the core which can get uh, used in both iOS, Android uh, or native, uh, JavaScript, uh, whatnot. Um, which is good because you've got the same kind of level of tooling for it and uh, Kotlin is also weird, or good, or I don't know, because it moves so quickly. The development is really, really, really fast with the language. Like, I've been following it uh, for a while. I've started with Android, so I kind of got into it from Android. And um, and yeah, like, every few months that I would look, at, look into it, 
uh, it would just have new features and uh, new integrations and obviously break things again. Again, tying everything to, to a single commit with all the configuration is great because you can always rebuild the same thing because it uses the same Gradle plugins, it uses the same uh, Kotlin compiler versions and so on. And you've also got scripting support. That's 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 really really interesting because you don't you don't have to write uh, scripts in a language that uh, you might not be very familiar with, like Bash, for example. Um, you can actually just execute Kotlin scripts in that, and uh, as part of your CI/CD pipeline, it should work, um, which is really really cool. So yeah, let's talk about those dimensions that I mentioned. First one, probably the most obvious one, is uh, speed. Because if we're using CI, CI especially for this, uh, to test our application, to get feedback out of it, to tell us, hey, your app is working or your app is not working because you missed some stuff to, uh, you missed to test some, some, stu some stuff, uh, you want that feedback as soon as possible because uh, you want to go as fast as possible, like these race cars. Uh, but this is only one level of um, level of uh, speed, basically that we can we can think of one dimension or sub dimension. The other ones is uh, like how long does it take us to actually get back from a failing build? So if we break something, especially on a main or master branch, whatever you're using, that means that we cannot inst. Uh, continue deploying that to our users. So if you got an urgent bug fix, good. Good luck getting that first back to passing all the tests and then to deploying. So uh, it's very important to kind of minimize that time to uh, br with breaking broken builds. And then you've got organizational things like how long does it take us to ship a feature as a team? Um, time to also test software upgrades, which is which is like quite uh, quite common in like my experience with Android and. Uh, Constantly up, updating uh, uh, Gradle plugins and, and whatnot because you can just easily set this up, try to run this on a parallel branch, and uh, see, hey, this would w work seamlessly, or hey, we actually need to do more work on this, and uh, less less kind of functional and more uh, practical for a team base. How long it takes to onboard a new team member because everything is at the end it's configured as code. Um, you can basically point a new team member that you have to that configuration, CI/CD configuration, and say, "Hey, this is which tests. Are, this tells you which tests are we're running. This tells you which environments we're uh, deploying to. Um, have a look, explore, and then come back to me with uh, specific questions, as opposed to trying to explain some someone like the whole world of your application first before." Uh, understanding like the whole landscape, which is like something nice that a CI/CD pipeline does give you. Um, so yeah, running pipelines faster—that's probably the most obvious one for everyone. Um, there's a couple of things we could do. So let's say you're running your compilation. Um, you have your app in multiple modules. Um, you got to make sure that your Kind of Gradle or Gradle assemble or whatever you're running is running at the w like with the most um, with the right size of resources. So the, the enough you give it enough RAM, you give it enough um, uh, CPUs, so you can use more threads basically, so you can do things in parallel faster. So there's a bit of uh, fiddling with this, like trying different uh, resources, but usually every kind of cloud-based CI tool that you have will allow you to kind of switch, hey, I want to build this on a bigger machine or a smaller machine. Um, so that's like very, very, very uh, useful. The next one is caching. Caching is nothing but deduplicating work. So uh, you've got Gradle cache. Make sure that that's turned on if you use Gradle. I'm not sure if Maven has a... a Similar thing, it probably does. You definitely have dependencies cache. So, um, so when you're installing your dependencies for the first time or in the CI, uh, CI setting, it can actually be every single time. You can actually check whether that dependencies definition has changed. If not, uh, just reuse whatever you installed the previous time because it's going to have the same versions. It's going to have the same... Uh, 
um, same specifics as before. So you can just like copy over stuff instead of downloading it from the web. And uh, <coughs> in some languages, you even have to compile some dependencies so you actually get stuff a lot faster. And then you can run things in parallel. I mentioned uh, Gradle's parallelization if you use Gradle. Um, but you can also run like different tests in parallel. Like you can run functional tests, you can run integration tests, you can run security scan, you can run assembly of your application if you're doing an Android application at the same time and just get the feedback with the with uh, as quickly as the slowest of those kind of jobs is actually going to run. So that's that's one uh, really good technique as well. Um, and then you have uh, your extensive test suites. So let's say you have, I don't know, 100 classes that you're trying to test, um, or 100 test classes. So you can basically split those between different parallel uh, jobs, which will run one or like a subset of those. Um, so let's say you have 100 test classes that run in uh, 10 minutes. So you split them across 10-ish parallel jobs, which will make sure that they probably run around one to two minutes as opposed to one job which runs in 10 minutes, basically. And you're just reusing the cloud resources and, uh, and uh, doing more in less time. Um, and lastly, you can pick what runs when. So what I mean by that is uh, if you have, a, for example, an uh, application that has a very extensive and uh, comprehensive test suites for like integration. You can actually not run that on every single commit, but run it on merge to the main branch, or uh, do it nightly, for example. Or if you have a multi-platform application, you can actually select, hey, we've actually just uh, touched the Android uh, part of that application and uh, not the iOS part of the application, so we can uh, don't have to recompile the Android bit, with uh, or not, not recompile the iOS bit. So you can do things like that uh, with uh, conf by configuring a CI CD. I have examples for most of these things. I don't have time for going into them, but happy to talk about uh, this for the entirety of the day, basically. Um, and obviously, not everything goes right at the first time. Some things, things break, and we need to recover from our failures. For that, we need to understand what's happening to our builds because we need to kind of know as quickly as possible where the problem lies so we can address it. What helps is seeing some dashboards. You probably have some dashboards. And uh, understanding, yes, this part of your uh, workflow has broken. This test job has broken. Let's try to re rerun just that. Uh, logging also helps. So whatever tool you're using for logging, whatever framework, whether it's your Gradle verbose mode, whether it's uh, whatever your application is, Make sure that you're able to, that you understand how to turn on all the verbose modes that you need, and then also extract those logs out so that you can uh, operate on them on your local machine as opposed to just scrolling through an endless log in the browser, which doesn't help. <coughs> Again, each tool is a bit different, so happy to show you that on CircleCI um, if you're interested afterwards. And lastly, you can also do things like debug builds as they fail. We have an SSH debugging feature, basically. Tests have broken. Let's SSH into a Docker container that's, run, that's running those tests and uh, explore why and actually how it's actually broken. That's that. And I mentioned in the beginning that it's like a, it's, it's CI CD speed is like a race car. It's not really, it's more of an ambulance because it still should go fast, but it should still carry the signal that you want to carry. So that was speed, but we have more things to talk about. One is security. And this is like very universal to every single language platform that you're using. Keep your credentials safe outside of your Git repositories. That's one thing. Every tool allows you to uh, have those encrypted, uh, encrypted credentials and inject them at compile time, at build time. So that contains uh, API keys. Uh, if you have like AWS uh, uh, environment uh, keys for deploying to your production environment, all of that stuff. Automate security scanning as well, which allows you to run things on your dependencies, for example, to say, hey, your dependencies contain something down the chain of dependency uh, graph um, that's actually got some malware, which is uh, a good way to avoid that. 
um, and think about splitting responsibilities between different parts of your uh, CI CD pipeline so that you're not giving uh, production deployment credentials to your uh, unit test jobs, basically. Um, <coughs> there's things you can do as well um, to go beyond the CI CD tool. So not only related to the features that you have built in, but things that you're working on as a team. So for example, you're using a project tracking uh, software. So maybe you can integrate with whatever Jira you're using, for example, and toggle a deployment that you've made to kind of indicate, hey, this bug fix has been fixed. This is the deployment version that, was, uh, that has this fixed. Again, the same with ops dashboards. You can maybe uh, hit some dashboards to kind of show this was a new deployment that was, now, that was made. Um, it's never a DevOps talk without talking about the team. I mentioned you can easily onboard team members with a CI CD configuration, but it's also good, really good practice to kind of make sure that everyone on the team is kind of on it basically and at least have a basic level of understanding of how things should work. And of course, uh, not everything works as planned. Sometimes we do mess up. Um, just like that, uh, was it uh, .32 patch for Kotlin that broke uh, Android libraries? Um, yeah, sometimes broken deploys will happen, something breaks. How can a CI CD tool help us with that? Basically, you can revert to the previous commit if it's not like a library that needs to be kind of updated downstream. Um, you can. If it's, a, for example, a website you can revert or a service you can revert to a previous commit that had this working and redeploy that, job done. Your job solved for the minute and then you can still address the problem under, that's underlying. It also helps you favor smaller changes because you're testing constantly, you're, you're verifying your stuff constantly. Uh, and the best way to prepare for this is to actually prepare and practice and have a playbook. Like, understand, this is, we've done a broken deploy whether it's a microservice, whether it's an application, how are we gonna address this? How are we gonna uh, tackle this? Practice uh, this every couple of months. And ultimately, to me, success with CICD means to be free to deploy software, to deliver software on your own terms. That allows you to focus on quality, that allows you to focus on your team happiness. And uh, yeah, that was kind of my idea. Happy to show you any examples and whatnot, and if you'd like some uh, swag and stuff, I've got circleci.com slash zan, you can uh, get some circleci swag, which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, happy to answer, I think we have like time for one question, if there is any. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, um, that person likes CI/CD but doesn't like YAML. Of course, uh, we actually did uh, release a preview version of uh, configuration SDK. So you basically, it, it's currently for JavaScript and TypeScript, but we're looking to support more languages. Uh, basically, you write it as you would write uh, kind of normal JavaScript DSL and then build that, which generates your YAML, but you don't have to actually touch that YAML. So uh, there are ways to get around that. And obviously, whatever can generate you like that kind of YAML code uh, can work. How long does it take you to build a pipeline? A very basic pipeline, you can actually get uh, predefined. If it's an Android application, you just get like uh, uh, Gradle assemble or Gradle build, which just runs your uh, some of your tests. Uh, I think we have like canned examples for this, uh, but depending how deep you want to go, basically. And if you meant execute, like it could be five minutes, it could be thirty minutes, it could be one hour. Uh, it really depends on what you're actually trying to achieve. I think that we're at time now. Happy to answer anything offline, obviously. Thank you.